down to their final strike with an elite closer on the mound, the Giants and Blake Sable got a miracle. And the vibes, the vibes are good. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspic, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Long Gun Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube. So check us out there if you haven't already, and hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Coming up on today's show, holy cow, the Giants got a miracle. I thought the game was over. I'm sitting there watching the game with family, which was a great time. Giants were winning, then they were losing, uh, and it... It looked like they were going to lose this game with it all coming down to Blake Sable, who, if we set the minimum to 50 plate appearances among all players in the major leagues, nobody has struck out at a higher rate than Blake Sable at 44.2%. And if we look at who was on the mound for the Cardinals, it's Ryan Helsley, who last year had a strikeout rate of nearly 40%, which is just bonkers for a reliever. This year is only 32%, which is still excellent, but you know, not quite at that bonkers top of the league level. But strikeout pitcher, guy who struck out more on a rate basis than anybody else in the sport, down to his final strike. I said it out loud, the game's over. Turns out I was right. The game was over because Blake Sable just hit a shot to dead center field, a no-doubter, home run in 30 out of 30 ballparks, turned a 4-3 uh, to three deficit into a 5, excuse me, yes, 4-3 to three deficit into a 5-4 to four win with one swing of the bat. Just what a huge momentum swing for the San Francisco Giants, who have now won four games in a row. They, you know, it's not like their record is great all of a sudden, but 10 and 13 sounds a lot better than 6 and 13, which is what they were. And just what it can do for a team, the chemistry, the way that they're celebrating in the clubhouse after a game like that. And for Sable specifically, we need to discuss his status on the roster because yesterday, if you listen to the show, I'm talking about how Sable's running out of time and that I even mentioned that he could possibly get like sent back to the Pirates at, ahead of yesterday's game. Turns out I was wrong. And w- Sable has a very interesting batting line in that he, when all is said and done, it's it's actually a league average batting line, but he's done it in a strange way. It is very difficult to accomplish overall what we would consider league average offense with a 44% strikeout rate and a 1.9% walk rate. The reason he's done it is that When he's managed to put the ball in play, he's gotten hits, and a lot of those hits have been for power. He's got four homers. He has seven, he has 11 hits, and four of them are homers. Over a third of his hits have been home runs. And, you know, what I've been saying is that having seen him play the outfield and having seen him catch, I believe and this is exactly the opposite of what I thought would be the case coming into the season, that he's a better catcher than he is an outfielder. And we all thought, this guy's an outfielder, they're trying him at catcher, and it's probably not going to work out defensively. But I have not liked some of the routes I've seen from Blake Sable in the outfield. And at the catcher position, the, the catcher's interference stuff, I think that can be worked on. And that's the result of just trying to put yourself in the best position to frame pitches. So like the intentions are good. It's not just like he he's like an idiot back there and he just doesn't know how to keep his glove out of the way. It's all, it's kind of a trade-off. You just have to be a little better at preventing it. But 
what you're trying to do is like on a like curveball. You know how they're dropping rapidly. If you let it get deep, you're going to catch it near the dirt. But if you reach out and kind of try to catch it earlier and then, you know, how they lower their glove these days, catchers do to the ground before the pitch comes in so that when they catch it, they're catching it on the way up. So then you reach out for that curveball and catch it as it clips the bottom of the zone, you get called strikes. And it turns out like, you know, the count, you would be amazed if you don't know this, like the difference in results for hitters when they have a first a first pitch strike versus a first pitch ball, you would be amazed. It's like, you're, you're like Willie Mays if you get a first pitch ball and you're like, you know, terrible if you get a first pitch strike. They count. And pitches, and this is why the automatic strike zone is, I'm dying for it, because the count changes everything. And it's not just the first pitch. It's like a 1-1 one, one pitch, whether it's going to be 2-1 or 1-2, it just makes the all the difference in the world. By the way, all the more impressive that Sable did this in a 1-2 count. It's not like he had an advantage count. It wasn't 2-1, 3-1, 3-0, 1-0. Even 1-1. One, one. It was 1-2 one and two against an elite pitcher with strikeout stuff. And so we could go on and on about Sable, and I will, but I do just want to mention also that Alex Pavlovich pointed out after the game that Sable saw 20 pitches in the course of the game, one fastball, 19 non-fastballs. It's a game plan that caught his eye earlier in the game. And on that last at bat, Sable said, quote, he didn't even show me the fastball. This is Hel- Brian Helsley who throws like 102 miles an hour. And he's like, he didn't even throw a single fastball in that at bat to me. I was just sitting slider there. And it happened to go my way. And in the post-game interview, and then later in another post-game interview, he literally said, I love the confidence of this guy. He was like, they they were afraid to throw me a fastball. And so I was sitting on the slider. Like, this is a guy who struck out at a higher rate than anybody in the sport when we set the minimum to 50 plate appearances. And he's talking about they're afraid to throw me a fastball. I love that because he's not like arrogant and annoying in like a way that some players are. <coughs> Fernando Tatis Jr. But, uh, <coughs> uh, excuse me, something in my throat there. Uh, no, Blake Sable's just kind of a fun guy and he has all the confidence in the world. So coming up in just a minute, more about Sable, more about the catcher position because Joey Bart exited the game the other day, two days ago, with a leg injury. We got an MRI. We have results. What does it mean about him? Sable, Gary Sanchez, Ricardo Henoves. So many, the catcher position is just a nonstop source of uh, content on the show. And we'll get into it in just a minute. Just a minute. But before we do, this episode is brought to you by so rare. Our new sponsor, So Rare, is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and a marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across th- all 30 MLB teams. So you can pick up your Sable card, <laughs> among others. Unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, So Rare managers truly own their fantasy experience, experience collecting, buying, selling, and competing with player cards against global opponents to win epic rewards. Win or lose, you still own your cards, and there's no cost to play. Plus, the more you win, the more you advance, collecting increasingly powerful cards and access- accessing next-level competitions and rewards. So Rare recently partnered with MLB All-Stars Juan Soto and Julio Rodriguez to serve as brand ambassadors. Head to SoRare.com slash LockedOn, that's spelled S-O-R-A-R-E, dot com to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's SoRare.com slash LockedOn to start playing today. This episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. Baseball is back, folks. Baseball is back in a major way. Grand slams, no hitters, double plays, walk-off homers. And there's no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. That's because right now new customers get a... uh, They can step up to the plate and get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up, place your first bet, 
and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. I'm currently, right this moment, looking at the odds on FanDuel for the Giants and the Cardinals tonight. I'm having a... Honestly, this moved since the last time I looked at it. The over-under was set at 9, and I was going to say, like, initially before even looking, I was going to intuitively say take the over, because I think today's the day the Giants really break out against a left-handed pitcher, which maybe are baked into the probabilities. But the over-under was set at 9, and I thought, actually, that's high, so I would take the under. But now people have agreed with me, and now it's moved down to 8.5. So... Uh, I think I will still take the under because Anthony DiSclefani has been so good. And so I look for him to continue that. Uh, I'm not entirely confident on this one. So check out, check the odds out for yourself right now and see how they're moving at FanDuel. And, you know, baseball is a daily sport. So if you want to pass today and do it tomorrow, that's fine too. So don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to a thousand dollars in bonus bets. Uh, when you join FanDuel today, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, here we go. More about the catcher position. Holy cow, have I talked about the catcher position a lot over the last two years. Like since Buster Posey retired, it has been a nonstop topic. And it's not because I don't I don't agree. There are some opinions out there that they've been like kind of not reckless but like careless about the catcher position I think that they've done a fine job considering like they want to what they want to do here in my opinion is if you've got a player like Joey Bart who you hope performs but you're not certain that he will right because certain major leaguers they just like Buster Posey at a certain point it's just like he's Buster Posey we expect we're just going to get Buster Posey performance. But when you're Joey Bart and it's like he hasn't performed yet, but like we hope that he can and the potential is in there, you don't want to just necessarily go out and just sign somebody like a Wilson Contreras to just take that job. And then you've like taken away the opportunity for the guy who could be good and is young and has the team control and all that. And so the way that they've done it, they've created a lot of inroads for a lot of different players like Sable. Uh, they're, they're like low risk, but, you know, I don't want to say high reward, but the potential for players to kind of break through. And you give a chance to Roberto Perez. He's kind of that solid veteran. And then you lose him. Austin wins. You, you kind of know what you were getting with him. You lose him. Joey Bart, I think it's just going to be continually giving him chances because Eventually, you run out of chances. When you lose all your minor league options and if you're not performing still, that's when things have to, like, something's got to give. But, you know, like Sable and Bart and then, like, signing Gary Sanchez, it's the same kind of deal where it's low risk, but it's, like, a guy who could perform. And so I think that the way they've handled it is fine. And catchers generally stink. Like, I, let's not, we're, we were spoiled by Buster Posey. Like, catchers, Blake Sable having a weighted runs created plus of 100 means he's probably been one of the best offensive catchers in the league. Certainly better than average, uh, even though I don't think it's sustainable if he's striking out 44% of the time. Thanks again for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. Every dayers, tomorrow on the show, we are going to be discussing, can the Giants win their fifth consecutive game they're going to be facing another lefty can they figure out a lefty they've quietly done better their last couple of times out against a lefty and can Anthony DiScalfani Tony DiScalfani keep it going he's been pitching so well the Giants play the Cardinals tonight at 6 45 Pacific catch every pitch of the Giants hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app search Giants so yes, we will continue our discussion of the catcher position for the Giants and how Joey Bart, this was a big deal. I I was really sad. If you listen to yesterday's show, the everydayers on yesterday's show heard me talking about how Joey Bart is performing well. He's hitting better. He's making much more contact. He's striking out less. We're talking about small samples here. I'm not promising it lasts. He's framing excellently. I've I noticed it with my eyes and the numbers back it up. Like immediately, his first game of the season, I was just like, holy cow, I've never seen him frame this well. And then, you know, there was a tweet the next day that was like, Joey Bart had one of the greatest framing games that has ever been tracked. 
Uh, and it wasn't just that the umpire was calling everything. It was just he, and just the way it looked. He's worked on it, and I'm impressed. And just the way his mentality, how he has not let this negativity get to him. People like me, kind of giving him a hard time or just you know pointing out his flaws. That's got to be tough. He obviously he's not listening to me. That's probably the, the the answer there. But it's not just me. You know, Susan Slusser has also been critical of Joey Bart or just essentially saying he's not necessarily not not necessarily the answer. Could be, but not necessarily. And so far, prior to the season, there were major red flags. Anyway, so he got hurt at like the exact wrong moment when he was finally seemingly putting it all together just the other day had to come out of the game got an MRI the MRI results per Alex Pavlovich didn't show any major issues he's confident he can avoid the injured list he said he can get behind the plate if needed like yesterday Uh, and then Pav says Sable is starting tonight against a lefty so uh, with a lefty on the mound tonight, it would be odd to see Sable in there, but they might not have a choice. Like if they don't think Bart needs to go on the IL, like he's close enough to like where tomorrow maybe he can play, they're not going to put him on the IL, in which case you can't have him back for like another week plus. Uh, And so you could see lefty Blake Sable in the lineup against a lefty, which is something you're not normally going to see. But it would be simply because of what's going on injury-wise with Joey Bart. But it's good news that the MRI didn't show any major issues. This is a groin strain, by the way. And Bart said it's been lingering and he just doesn't really know why it's happening. And it's just there and there's really no explanation. And therefore, it's frustrating for him. But what's also interesting about this, following up on it, is that it was Ricardo Genoves not Gary Sanchez, who was on the taxi squad. And so essentially, you know, probably before they got the MRI results, they had to be prepared in case Joey Bart had to go on the IL. And if he did, you needed a second catcher. You cannot, I mean, Blake Sable is barely a catcher himself, as I I do now think he's done a good enough job where I consider him a catcher. There's more to be seen, but I mean, he's held his own back there, in my opinion. Catcher interference notwithstanding. But uh, it was Ricardo Genoves, who's not Gary Sanchez, who was on the taxi squad in case Bart had to go on the IL. And so we need to talk about Ricardo Genoves and about Gary Sanchez because uh, Ricardo Genoves is a catcher who's been in, in the upper minors for the Giants for a little while. We're going to get to his like numbers and performance in just a minute. He's 23 years old, drafted in... I guess he was an international signing. It appears he wasn't a draftee. But he's been in the organization since 2016 was when he first debuted in rookie ball. And he spent a good chunk of 2022 in AAA where he didn't hit well. He didn't hit well in AA either. And in AAA this season, he has done well, better than Gary Sanchez. He's the offensive environment in the minor leagues is bonkers. And so you might see traditional numbers that really jump off the page like, oh, he's got a 380 batting average. You'd be like, he's awesome. He's ready. But then you'll find out it's like a below average overall offensive profile given. It's like if all the teams were playing at Coors Field and using metal bats, like the offense is just bonkers. And so what is good by major league standards isn't necessarily good by the standards in triple a and so you know henovace he's hitting 300 408 on base with a 14 percent walk rate that you love to see uh 400 slugging so he hasn't hit for much power but it's overall a roughly league average line a little bit above league average whereas gary sanchez is uh hitting i need to get the minor league numbers pulled up here. He's only hitting 159 with a 333 on base because he's walked 17 and a half percent of the time. This is robust. Normal walk rates are around 9%. So both of these guys way above average, but 17 and a half percent is like really, really good. And uh, only a 182 slugging. So Gary Sanchez, he hasn't really hit in the minor leagues. Uh, and so 
it is interesting. I guess it makes a lot of sense that maybe uh, they just think Sanchez is still rusty and they just want to give him more time. But the fact that he's got this opt out looming on May 1st, which is so soon from now, all of a sudden we're here. It is the 26th and May 1st is Monday. So it's Wednesday now. By Monday, Gary Sanchez has to be in the major leagues on the San Francisco Giants roster or else he can just peace out and say, uh, see ya, I'm a free agent, I'll sign with somebody else. Or he could say, I don't want to opt out, I think I have a good opportunity here. So that could happen. There's all kinds of possibilities. And if Bart doesn't have to go on the IL, and if they want to keep holding on to Sable, is there even room for Gary Sanchez? And in, and in that case, maybe that's just the decision, is that it's Sable and Bart, and you're just not going to change that up. And then Henoves is kind of your backup. Uh, plan and he was last night interestingly not Gary Sanchez even with this looming opt-out and so all of that is something to watch moving forward daily daily especially by Monday and so that's going to be fascinating and we will cover it every day and the everydayers will hear those updates each and every single day so coming up in just a minute I got some questions last night because Mitch Hanniger finally found his way back into the lineup two days ago after being on the IL all year, started a game against the lefty, sat against a righty. What's going on? Are the Giants platooning Mitch Hanniger? Is Mitch Hanniger yet another platoon player for the San Francisco Giants, or is he not? We will answer the question definitively in just a minute. But before we do, this episode is brought to you by my new favorite game, Ultimate Baseball GM. Have you ever dreamed, like me, of becoming a major league general manager. It was my dream for a long time, to be honest. And I have since given up on that dream, but yet I still have I still yearn for the challenge of what it would be like to run a major league organization and put the pieces together and win a championship. That's what it's all about for me. And I'm able to put those skills to the test with a challenging yet extremely fun game, Ultimate Baseball GM. Hiring the right coaches and staff, managing team finances, scouting and drafting players, managing difficult personalities and team chemistry, injuries, free agency, all the ups and downs of a season, just like in real life. So it's my favorite game. Locked on Giants listeners get 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo Locked on in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probaseballgm.com, scan the code or look it up on the app stores. That's probaseballgm.com. Ultimate Baseball GM. Start your dynasty today. All right, as promised, are the Giants dealing with yet another platoon situation here with Mitch Hanniger? We thought uh, when the Giants signed him that he was not going to be a platoon player, and yet in his second game back from the injured list, he's not in the starting lineup. It wasn't a surprise that uh, Austin Slater was not in the starting lineup because he is a platoon player. But it was a mild surprise that Mitch Hanniger wasn't in there. So the definitive answer I have for you, I'll tell you in just a minute. Thanks again for making Lo- for making Locked on Giants your first listen. Every day or tomorrow on the show, we'll be, we'll be breaking down. Uh, can the Giants break out against a lefty? The Giants play the St. Louis Cardinals tonight at 645 Pacific. Catch every pitch of the Giants hometown broadcast, which is always awesome, with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Search Giants. Mitch Hanniger, is he a platoon player? Definitive answer here. No question. The answer. Not a platoon player. He is not going to be platooned. You do not have to worry about that. Uh, I figured it out. I figured out why. First of all, like my immediate response is like a little bit of concern. Like, I hope that he didn't aggravate anything because he's coming back from what was first an oblique injury and then it became a back thing. And obliques and backs are just not really injuries you want to be dealing with as a baseball player. And so a little bit concerned when he's not in the lineup like one day after coming back. However, I figured it out. They want to ease him in. The first game he played was a lefty starting pitcher. Yesterday was a righty starting pitcher. Tonight is another lefty starting pitcher. And so 
My theory is they didn't want him to just immediately jump in and play three straight games. And so if you want him to play two of the first three games just to ease him in, the day to give him the day off is against the right-handed pitcher. Not because he's a platoon player, but if you're going to do two out of three, it might as well be the two when there's a lefty on the mound. And so I just want to be clear about that, that Mitch Hanniger is not going to be platooned. They did not, the, the contract doesn't reflect a platoon player. Like some guys are just platoon players and, and their contracts reflect it. But Mitch Hanniger, they gave this guy three years, $43.5 million. You do not do that to be a platoon player. Plus the numbers back up that he's just, he doesn't deserve to be a platoon player. In his career, Mitch Hanniger has hit 255 with a 328 on base, and the real number that jumps out is a 466 slugging against right handed pitching. So, without the platoon advantage, that's about 18% above average offense when he's facing a righty in his career. Against a lefty, what did I just say? 18% above average against righties. Against lefties, 32% above average. So yes, that's platoon splits. But if you're significantly above average against both, that's how you become an everyday player. You look at a guy like Jock Peterson, he's got numbers similar to what I'm looking at when Hanniger has the platoon advantage. Jock has those kind of numbers when he's facing a righty. But when he's facing a lefty, there's a... uh, You know, he's like 30% below average. So anyway, against lefties, Hanniger in his career has hit 276 with a robust 353 slugging and also, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, 353 on base and also a 498 slugging. So he's just a monster against left-handed pitching historically. So this guy is an important part of this team. Michael Conforto is an important part of this team who is also someone who is not probably, he has more susceptibility to being a platoon player uh the splits are my, like he and Mike Stremski both have around the same kind of slightly below average career performance against lefties the difference is Hanniger has been even better than Yastrzemski by a lot even even though Yaz is good against righties Conforto has been a monster against righties and so there there's probably gonna be times when Conforto sits against a lefty and Yaz starts, but it's like one of those two on any given day against a lefty should be in the lineup. And with Ruff on the IL, it might even be both of them. But anyway, as I've mentioned a million times, you cannot platoon at every position. It, there's nine guys on the in the lineup. And if you had two guys per lineup spot, that's 18 position players, which would leave you with what? Uh, eight, uh, 10 how many rosters? There's 26 roster spots. That would leave you with eight pitchers. And no, they're going to have 13 or 12 pitchers all year. And so anyway, Conforto, he's had his struggles, uh, has gotten on base a lot via the walk, but the strikeout rate is abnormally high for him. The batting average is only 200. He's hit some big homers though. Uh, he has yet to get it going, but I still believe long-term in Michael Conforto. And of course, again, once again, I talked up Tyro Estrada so much the other day, and he's done nothing but struggle at the plate since. Although he did have a single, a steal, and then two errors on the play and came around to score, and that run was huge. So I guess not not all bad for Estrada, and he's continued to play solid defense. The, The Giants as a team, the defense has not really been a problem this year, despite, you know, so many people freaking out about the defense. Stuff doesn't always carry over one year to the next. Last year, it was unexpected how bad they were defensively. This year so far, I mean, the likes of J.D. Davis playing like a gold glover. Who in the world saw that coming? Nobody. Baseball is hard to predict. That's the final takeaway. Sable, a home run there. How likely was that? Very unlikely, but it happened, and it was a dub for the Giants. So thanks again for making Lockdown Giants your first listen. Every day or tomorrow on the show, we'll be breaking down Can the Giants get to a lefty? Just get to him. Maybe take the over on that FanDuel bet because they're just going to light up. Steven Matz, who's just, you know, he's a major league pitcher, but he's a guy who's got an ERA of 5.66 in his Cardinals career spanning 70 innings. And so get to this guy. Uh, The Giants take those guys on, the Cardinals and Matz at 645 Pacific. 
Catch every pitch of the Giants' hometown broadcast, which is always great, with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Giants. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot, so thank you in advance. And thanks to everyone who's done so already. Can't wait to be with you again tomorrow talking about how the Giants blow up Stephen Matz, hopefully. So anyway, thanks again for listening. Amazing game yesterday. Go Giants. You are now Locked on Giants.